Apple gets a rare downgrade. Cadoba versus Chipotle. What does it mean for Chipotle's future? And Jeff Kleintop from Charles Schwab on what 2018 holds for equities. All today on the bottom line from the NASDAQ market site in Times Square. Jack in the Box has announced this week that they are going to sell their Mexican chain Cadoba to private equity firm Apollo for $305 million. So of course, Cadoba is a close competitor with Chipotle, even though it's a lot smaller. So how do the two compare? Well, Cadoba only has about 700 stores versus Chipotle's over almost 3,000 actually. And even though Cadoba has 700 stores, only about 358 of them are owned by the company where the rest are franchisees. But what does this mean for Chipotle's valuation? If you look at the $305 million price tag and you divide that by the number of stores, even just the ones that Cadoba actually owns, that works out to less than a million dollars per store. And Chipotle's valuation puts them at over $3.5 million per store. So as we've seen, the Chipotle stock price has dropped in more dropped by more than half since 2015, since its peak, it could have a lot further to go. It's been crushed, and your analysis says yes. It's called by another two-thirds, at least, to get to parity. I have never eaten at Qdoba, as you call it. Mexican food snobs seem to say it's maybe better yeah. than Chipotle, which means could be big growth prospects. So I also still eat at Chipotle. They're empty now, very fast, it's very convenient. So that's good. I'm not ready to give up on them. but. Got to say, the comparison does look worrisome. Yeah. I mean, I have eaten a Cadoba, and Business Insider has looked into this, and customers seem to like Cadoba a lot for many reasons. First of all, they've always had queso, and it's free, and their guacamole is free, and people like their queso more than we've heard people like Chipotle's queso. They also have much more on the menu. I like that they have quesadillas. I do like Chipotle's burritos more, but... They call Chipotle, some people are worried about menu fatigue. Like you go, you eat the same thing every day, right? Every day. What do you Reduce get? Reduce decisions in your life that don't matter. So I eat the same thing. What yes. do you get there? I get a bowl. It's not even important. But why can't Chipotle just change its food a little bit? Maybe they have to give free guacamole. Maybe they have to have better queso. They can revitalize it, I think. Yeah. They're in good position. Mm -hmm. So it's not over yet, but certainly this comparison compete. is worrisome. Absolutely. Apple stock price has almost doubled in the run-up to the iPhone X, the biggest iPhone launch in history. But is it time to bail out? An analyst this week cut his rating saying it is, in fact, time to bail out. Why? Because in prior product cycles, Apple has run up right into the cycle, even lasts a little bit longer, but then there's a big swoon afterwards as everyone loses enthusiasm and we have to wait for the next big product. Sarah, is the analyst right, or is Apple just going to now go up forever? Well, he says that the super cycle is over and that this is the end of it. And last month we talked about a UBS note that said there will be no super cycle for the iPhone 10. So it's very possible that it could be over. And also when you look at, he points out that the P ratio of Apple right now at about 15x is very similar to like the peaks of the last two super cycles at around 13. And after those super cycles, they drop to eight or nine X. So I, it, to me, it seems like if that correction happens, then Apple has a big correction ahead of it. And this, by the way, is exactly what we have been saying on this show for a year now, which is there is going to be a time to bail out of this if you're a short-term trader. And we are certainly approaching that on a normal cycle basis. You, sometimes it's right at, when the phone's announced. Sometimes it's six months or a year later. But we're getting closer, so I understand why the analyst made a call. I will say one caveat is that I thought the iPhone 10, as you say, looks like the iPhone X, which is what I call it, was it, that that was it. There was gonna be no more exciting stuff in smartphones, the category is mature, it's boring, sure, we're gonna wait for the X because it's thinner and so forth. But I have heard rumors recently that they are gonna come out with another X next year that is bigger. As you know, one of the big selling points about the X is that it is this form factor, which is the six plus, and yet it's much smaller. It's a bigger screen, but in the smaller thing, everyone likes those svelte phones. They're so much better. But I actually don't like that because it's not as wide. It's harder to type. If they put the same kind of screen in this baby so it's even bigger, love my big screens. So to me, 
That could be another that product cycle. That could trickle in the new super cycle. Yes. Well, we've been so. thinking for years we've been waiting for this one. Yeah. It's going to be the crowning glory. Finally, the big 10th anniversary. It's come out. Everyone's very excited about it. Best phone ever, everybody says. But again, if you're obsessed with screen size, as I am, it's kind of a little disappointing. It's a little thin. And so if they want to take the same magic and extend it on this, I will certainly not be waiting in line, but I might be a buyer, and more importantly for the stock, it might actually start this excitement hype cycle going again, and maybe that finally gets us to $200 a share in a trillion dollar company. We shall see. Otherwise, I'm with this analyst. Jump out of the plane. More jubilation from Bitcoin speculators as the cryptocurrency almost hit 20,000, but it is now plunged midweek, setting off fears that this is once again a massive bubble. Everyone is going to lose their shirts. Sarah, where are we? What's going on? I mean, we, they did lose a lot in price over the last day and a half, and a lot of that may be because its counterpart, Bitcoin Cash, um, has been given a little bit of legitimacy by being added to Coinbase after a long fight to get there, um, which usually does boost prices and add to legitimacy. And there does seem to be a pretty strong battle between the two, but it doesn't mean the end of Bitcoin. Bitcoin, Bitcoin Cash, Litecoin. What a reminder of the 1990s, dot-coms, Amazon 2, the bookstores that are all like Amazon. This is what's happening. By the way, this goes back to one of the things that we talked about last week, which is Richard Bernstein, strategist, saying that Bitcoin actually meets all five criteria for a speculative bubble, one of which is more new issues, more ways to play it, as everybody wants to get in on the game. And when you say Bitcoin cash, that's what I hear. And Another, also, hey, it costs less. Maybe it'll quadruple. I think I'll put my money there. And one of his other points is that other that people can easily get access to it. And Bitcoin cash becoming on CoinDesk is exactly one of those things. So here is my point to you. This is what I hear. It, being set up as Either the Bitcoin faithful are right, and Bitcoin is the future, and all things are going to be cryptocurrency, and everybody out there who cackles or sort of asks questions about Bitcoin just doesn't get it, or it's just a gigantic bubble, and speculators are fools, and it's all going to go to a dollar, and there's going to be tears and all that stuff. Here is my point to you. These two things are not mutually exclusive. It can be both. Bitcoin can have a glorious future that is going to change the world. And this run in particular could be a massive bubble. It could go back to $100 a coin. Everybody loses 99%. That is exactly what happened with the dot-coms. That was the argument in the 1990s. Is it a bubble or is it a profound new technology that's going to change the world? Turned out both were right. Lots of people made a lot of money on the way up, lost their way down, but then made it back if they stayed around for the long haul. So maybe that's where we are going to be headed with all of this. And I think that's completely fair. Oh, fair? Take a position. I no, I think it's fair, because I don't know what Bitcoin's price should be. I do think that there's still a lot more money to come into it. I still talk to people, and everybody's still talking about it, but not everybody has their money in it yet. Because not everybody wants to wake up the next morning and find that they've lost 99% of their money. And that's fair. Yes. I'm here with Jeff Kleintop, Chief Investment Strategist at Charles Schwab. Thank you so much for joining me. It's great to be here. So equity valuations are, by most measures, at their all-time highs. And a lot of people are wondering, is this the top? Can they continue higher? What's your response to that? You know, I think 2018 could be a really good year. It'll be the first year of back-to-back, -back broad global economic growth we've seen in more than a decade. Every one of the world's 45 largest economies is going to grow next year, very likely. That means further earnings growth. That was the secret to 2017's success. It was really about earnings growth rising every month, pushing stocks higher every month. We could see that again in 2018. The, the concern I would only have is this. Yield curves are beginning to flatten out a little bit. It's usually could be bad news for those high valuations. Could point to a recession in maybe 2019 or beyond. So while 2018 looks good, you have to keep on watch. And for 2018, is there anything that you're watching that might concern you that could lead to an equity crash? You know, there are a, a number of risks. Uh, China, China's economic growth, certainly a potential for a slowdown there could shock the rest of the world. Emerging markets, a big part of why stocks did so well in 2017. Natural disasters, geopolitics, all these things that are ever present in the markets could come back to be a risk in 2018, particularly if economic growth begins to slow later in the year. That could create some vulnerabilities we didn't see in 2017 where 
politics, geopolitics, and the like really couldn't nudge the markets very much at all. And you didn't mention the Fed or inflation at all. You're not worried about the Fed? Not so much. I think we're, we're actually starting to see a clearer path for inflation. Inflation expectations are beginning to tick up, and that means the personalities at the Fed and other central banks matter less because the data is going to matter more. The, currently, the expectations in the market are for the Fed to do two, maybe as much as three rate hikes next year. I think the market's braced for that. I don't think that'll be a big risk. And you like you think things look good in 2018. Is there a particular place that you think is a great place to invest? I think the most important thing is to go global. Usually in, in the last year or two of a business cycle, international stocks tend to outperform U.S. stocks. They're more cyclical, they're more inflation sensitive, and valuations look a little bit more attractive too. But one thing you have to keep in mind is don't concentrate. You want to be broad and, and, and really be diversified. And here's why. You know, usually we always look for a certain sector or country that's going to do well. But for the first time in 20 years, correlations have come down. Now, this is important. This is how different markets behave relative to each other. And so we're seeing the lowest correlations, meaning the best benefit from diversification in 20 years. So you don't want to overlook that. Some investors, this is the best environment for global diversification they've ever seen in their investing careers. And when we talk about high valuations and equities, we also are seeing extremely high valuations in tech. Do you have any, do you feel differently about tech than the rest of equity? You know, tech, we still like tech, actually, and I think as business spending begins to pick up in 2018, tech will benefit from that. Maybe not the consumer side of tech, which has really been where the markets have been focused on. Maybe more the business spending side of technology, where the valuations aren't quite as high, but could see more earnings momentum in 18. What do you think the impact of tax reform will be for equities in 2018? The thing about tax reform is it's not just in the U.S. We're seeing it everywhere. Many countries have cut corporate taxes in the last few years. Uh, the budget in France, they've already proposed some corporate tax cuts for next year. In, J in Japan, they've already put it into legislation. It's already baked in. They're phasing it in next year. In Germany, the coalition talks are coming around. One of the only things they can agree on is some corporate tax cuts. So we may see that across the board next year. A further lift to profits in 2018 should be good news for uh, for uh, investors who continue to be very focused on profit growth. And is that generally already priced in to global equity prices? Well, I, I think there's some optimism about that taking place, but we're not yet seeing analysts put it into their estimates yet. And that's key because stocks tracked estimates in 2017. And I have to ask, Bitcoin. A lot of people are calling it a bubble. What do you think and what are your clients asking you about? You know, it, I get this question a lot everywhere I go or all around the country, really all around the world. The big question about Bitcoin is, is it a bubble? Uh, from the fear of, did I miss it? But also, what happens if the bubble bursts? We know what happened when the dot-com bubble burst. We know what happened when the housing bubble burst. I think the, the Bitcoin bubble, if you want to call it that, is something different if prices for Bitcoin were to plunge suddenly because it's so independent from the financial system. It's kind of its own thing. It hasn't yet become embedded uh, in the economy and, and, and the financial structure. And that means a, a bubble burst there wouldn't have the same negative ripple effects we've seen from past bubbles. I don't think investors need to worry about a potential burst of that bubble in 2018. Unless you're invested in it. Of course. Yeah. <laughs> Great. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Thanks for having me, Sarah. Recently, I traveled to Boston to speak to Fidelity Investments sector strategist Denise Chisholm. Here's what she had to say to look forward to next year. So we've had really strong corporate profit growth recently. Is that something you expect to continue? So by way of background, I do a lot of historical analysis. Sectors are really my lens, but historic probability analysis is my process. That was a key theme that got us into profits in terms of 2014 to 2016, had a corporate profit recession. And what we saw along with that was defensive rotation of, if you split the sectors up, you can see more stable oriented sectors like consumer staples, utilities, healthcare, and telecom outperforming those more cyclically oriented or economically sensitive sectors like tech, industrials, energy, and financials. We saw that outperformance, that defensive rotation, into that low of 2016 when we, when we saw Brexit. Now coming out of that, that's been a key theme this year and will be a key theme to watch going into next year. And I think we've seen some pretty good catalysts to give us stronger odds of that profit corporate profit recovery continuing over the next year, one of which is the depreciation we've seen in the dollar. Now, the dollar has been a headwind to corporate profits with so many foreign revenues being overseas. Now, with the depreciation we've seen has been an extreme amount, only happened five times in history, we see higher odds to corporate profit growth into next year 
coupled this time with an acceleration in inflation from a probability perspective. Now also that because of seen. the depreciation in the dollar? Exactly. Now that we haven't seen since 2013. So this will be the first time in quite a while, if this plays out, that we'll see a corporate profit recovery joined with an acceleration in inflation. And what are those two things moving together? What, what does that lead to as far as sectors and performance? Right. So when you think of an odds framework, you think, what does this change the odds in history of? And usually those inflections are significant. What we can expect is an incremental increase in probabilities of higher rates into 2018 as we exit this year. And what that means is a little bit misconstrued when you talk to clients. People think higher rates, that means get defensive, not pro-cyclical or economically sensitive. And actually what you see in history is that economically sensitive sectors really do tend to outperform. And that's because more often than not, higher rates is a reflection of growth, not a deterrent to it. Now that's not all examples in history, but again, more often than not. And what sectors are those that will benefit from this environment? So if you look even over just the last two years, and we've talked about this in the QSU over the last couple quarters, the two sectors that have the best risk rewards are financials and technology. Again, two very pro-cyclical sectors, but interestingly enough, have been negatively correlated year to date. I think there's a lot of investors out there that think, A, higher interest rates are negative for growth, like technology, uh, and B, growth can't outperform with something value-oriented like financials. And again, even if you narrow your time frame to the last two years, and much less to the last 60 years, you see that technology and financials both have higher odds of outperforming in that scenario. And everybody's talking about tax reform right now. If we get a tax reform that we're looking at now, what Ben, what sectors will benefit? Mm. Interesting. So what we've seen is five cases in history where taxes have changed, whether it be up or down. Not a lot of instances, right? But you can still study it to sort of gauge some historic evidence. And one of the things that you see that's very clear and that really hasn't been discounted year to date is the benefit to small caps relative to sort of larger cap stocks. We've seen them sort of struggle and let's call it sort of uh, uh, flat year to date on that basis. But we could expect, at least from using history as a guide, that if tax reform goes through, A, that will be pro-cyclical, again, an orientation towards those economically sensitive sectors. That's no surprise. But potentially a three to 400 basis point tailwind for going down the spec cap spectrum. Okay, and when you talk about pro-cyclical, what sectors are you talking about? So we're talking about anything that's not defensive. So the defensive sectors are consumer staples, utilities, healthcare to a lesser extent, and telecom, right? Because you go out, even during times of economic stress, you buy your toothpaste, you turn on the lights, you go to the doctor, you pay your cable bill. Anything on the other side of the ledger is economically sensitive, where you vary your exposure or your consumption patterns when economics are a problem. And so that is energy, industrials, materials on that global cyclical spectrum, technology, financials, and consumer discretionary. And I'm actually going to include REITs in there, because historically, it's actually been more economically sensitive than sort of recession-proof or defensive. As you look at all of these different factors over the next year, tax reform, raising rates, inflation, what is the, the key factor that will most affect stock performance over the next year? The key theme is the corporate profit recovery. And to the extent that we just came out of a corporate profit recession, we actually very well may be, may be in the early stages of a recovery. That's it for this week. For the bottom line from the NASDAQ market site in Times Square, thanks to Fidelity Investments for making the show possible. And that is it for us for 2017. We'll see you in 2018.